You may build classroom some Supply of planning materials, pay fees, give scholarships. You may build clinics some hospital some Supply water, build bungalows for teachers and nurses. Supporting girls, feeding workers. Buy fair, donate today. You may build vocational school. You may build science lab somewhere. Bus project 20%. Cash distribution. Women empowerment. Women empowerment. Welcome, fair trade. Welcome, change. Welcome, fair trade. Welcome, peace. Welcome, fair trade. Welcome, free. Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome fair trade, welcome peace. Welcome fair trade, welcome free. Oh yeah, we getting higher daily. We moving forward slowly. The million reasons why we just fair, we just fair trade. We getting higher daily. We moving forward slowly. The million Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome fair trade, welcome peace. Welcome fair trade, welcome freedom. Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome fair trade, welcome peace. Welcome fair trade, welcome freedom. Oh yeah. Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome fair trade, welcome peace. Welcome fair trade, welcome freedom. Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome fair trade, welcome peace. Welcome fair trade, welcome freedom. Welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome peace, welcome freedom. Changing the world, changing the world, changing the world. So welcome fair trade, welcome change. Welcome peace, welcome freedom, changing the world, changing the world, changing the world. Special dedication to our customers in Europe, most especially United Kingdom, to management and staff of Golden Exotics and Golden Organics Limited. Also to Mr. Ben Rich, Mr. George Boye, Mr. Emmanuel Agbado, Ms. Abena Amponse Ewa, Mr. Kofi Chum Kunadu, Mr. Isaac Tekwe and all FPC members. Bow. So, welcome everybody. Welcome Fair Trade and uh, happy Ghana Independence Day. It's wonderful to see everybody here. Uh, so tonight we've got a very special event at the close. Fairtrade Fortnight 2022. This is the third in the Fairtrade National Campaign and Committee's POCO trilogy. So you may have been with us last week where we spoke to uh, Shared Interest Foundations called Joko Kotsi, um, and he was telling us about the challenges facing cocoa farmers um, in Ghana. And specifically, one of the things he was saying was that actually it was quite difficult for um, young people to see a future in fair trade. Um, and, and in, in cocoa growing. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, share with you some ideas of how we can address that tonight. Um, and then the second event was uh, on Thursday and we learned how to make a fantastic chocolate tart. Um, so uh, we've already started recording. Um, this will be available afterwards for people to who either who weren't able to come or if you wanted to have a look at it again. That fabulous uh, track was from Richard Wiafe, who is a farmer who works for uh, Golden Exotics um, in Ghana, um, and they're a fair trade banana um, factory uh, farm. Um, so in a few minutes, I'm going to hand you over to Adele from Afkaniwa. Um, but one of the things I wanted to share with um, is a, a fantastic piece of art that was created at the start of Fair Trade Fortnight this year. It features uh, Bismarck Kwabite, who is a cocoa farmer from Ghana, um, and it was done in Yorkshire. 
by an organization called um I've forgotten the name of the organization. Sand in Your Eye, that's what they're called. And they're based in Yorkshire and they do fantastic land art. So if you give me one second, I should share that with you now. My name is Bismarck Fabite, 36 years old, a young cocoa producer in a small community called Alavanyo in the Hapo region, Ghana, West Africa. There are a lot of challenges due to the climate issue but the major ones are the mortality, uh, flower abortion, disease and pest attack uh, and low production yeah, in cocoa. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to hand you over to Adele now um, and she will explain the um, Chocolate Has a Name project. Thank you very much indeed, Joanna. It's, it's just an absolute honour to share this space with you and the rest of the community. I also wish to thank the NCC for organising tonight's event. I'm incredibly honoured. And to all things and all people, Ghana, happy Independence Day, home and away. My name is Adele Asante, founder of ENT Foundation a Sine Tetrema Foundation, where we use diverse forms of creativity to promote social cohesion. Under the ENT umbrella, we also run a storytelling forum called African Iwa. So this evening, I bring you greetings from African Iwa, our very diverse tribe, where through the sacred and the fine art of storytelling, we endeavor to speak one common language, the language of unity in diversity. Um, John, at this point, I'm not sure if Emmanuel is, is on the call. Um, he will be sharing some screen as I speak. So Emmanuel, if you're on the call, um, Emmanuel will be sharing some photos um, as I speak. Underpinning the work we do at African Iwa is a proverb. One of the many proverbs I would grow up hearing from my grandmother, Akosia Otenewa Onyamaka. I describe my grandmother as a one woman ensemble on whose tongue lived oracy and literacy. My grandmother was an incredible storyteller, but she was also a cocoa farmer. And for three generations, women in my family have tilled and toiled the soil as cocoa farmers in a village that will be known and be called as Seshi Akwai. So tonight, in honor of my grandmother, I share this proverb with you. Sawan kasa boni which also means if you do not tell your story, be sure someone else would, and they might not tell it right. We started African Iwa hinged on this proverb, and over after a year or so, we still continue to hold this space, which we are able to share with the wider community. So in recent times, when I have the privilege to share in spaces like this, I introduce myself as a human lived experience storyteller. But what does that mean? Well, it means that the story I tell are true stories. And when I do, I like to meet with you at a place we like to call the awareness of awareness. And at this place, we begin to go into spaces and places with names, names that might sound familiar or maybe not. We begin to see faces 
The faces of people with names, names that might sound like yours or maybe not. But at some point when I tell this story, I shall pause. And when I do, you will hear me say something like this. Now listen, listen to your thoughts, your feelings and your bodily responses. And when I do, I hope you pause and listen to your thoughts, your feelings and your bodily responses. Um, at this point, I've not heard from Emmanuel. So Joanna, if you could start with my um, images, the second one, and then I shall start. So about a year ago, we would tell a story at Afrikaniwa, and that's Afrikaniwa. So the next one, thank you. We would tell a story at Afrikaniwa, a story we would call Chocolate Has a Name, and it does. But we needed an expert witness. And at Afrikaniwa, what we do is we invite only experts to tell the story a different kind of an expert, an expert not born out of years of academic research, but an expert born out of the lived and the living experience. And so when we wanted to tell our story, we invited this expert, a woman who lives and farms cocoa at a village somewhere in Ghana called Ahuim, and that is Mami Boidwa. We invited Mami Boidwa to come and share her story. And Mami Bodwa did. She came and she shared her story with such unspeakable grace. On that Zoom call was my very good friend, Natalie, a self-confessed chocoholic. It was absolutely magical. This will be the first time Natalie will see face to face a real cocoa farmer. One which she could ask questions in real time and in real time get real responses. Mami Burdua shared her story so beautifully. She would even talk about how she dries her beans. And that brought back beautiful memories of my grandmother, who would also dry her beans every morning under God's rich vitamin D sun. And when my grandmother dried her beans, she would wrap those beans back and forth. What you saw there was a high level of attunement between the farmer and her produce. My grandmother sometimes dried her beans singing, praying, and praising. My grandmother's beans were no ordinary cocoa beans. Storied in each bean were the hopes, her dreams, her aspirations, and her fears for herself and her community. And such was a story that Mami Boudoir will share. She loved everything about being a cocoa farmer. But as she shared her story, we also saw a woman with an insecure livelihood. We saw a woman heart abandoned to injustice. Mami Buedua had questions and concerns. She wondered why on a monthly basis, girls in her community will fall out of school as a result of period poverty. She wondered why teachers were not accepting job offers to teach in her community. She wondered why children in her community had to work miles and miles and miles to access education. She wondered why seasonally the roads leading to and from her village will be flooded. Mami Boudra wondered why it was so easy for foreigners to pick up their backpacks and visit her farm with recorders and cameras to take photos and videos and ask questions in the name of research. Sometimes Mami Boudra dreamt dreams of following her beans to the other side. She wanted to know what the others were doing with her beans, how were they using it? She had dreams and she had questions of wondering how they were perhaps using, overusing, disusing, or maybe misusing her beans. She wanted to know. But maybe this is not even a story about Mami Boidoa. Perhaps this is a story about the many thousands, if not millions, of cocoa farmers in Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Perhaps this is a story of the many farmers who contribute up to about 70% to the world's cocoa beans. Believe me, the plight of the cocoa farmer is not accidental, neither is it incidental. It is deeply historical and structural. Every day on every cocoa farm in Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Now, listen. Listen to your thoughts, your feelings, and your bodily responses. 
You hear stories like Mami Boydoes and you begin to grapple with yourself. You ask yourself, what does social change mean and social justice means to somebody like Mami Boydoa? What if she could wake up one morning and actually eat and drink and taste social change and social justice? What if she could wear social change? What if she could touch and feel social justice? What would it mean to Mami Boydoa? But also on the call was this man, Bruce Crowther. Bruce Crowther is the founder of the Fair Trade Towns Systems. Bruce's image will come shortly. And on the call was also my friend and my brother, Musan Jufu. Musan Jufu is a storyteller who lives in Uganda. And on that call was also my friend, Alison Jones. Alison values food. And she's part of a growing network of people in the UK who also value food. They even have a name. They are called the Incredible Edibles. Alison was also on the call. And Bruce would tell a story, a story quite visceral. Moose and Jufu will wake up in the morning and write a blog about a story quite visceral. Alison still remembers. And just last Thursday, I saw Alison and she asked me if I did remember the story, to which I said yes. A story quite visceral. Bruce continues to tell that story, but ever so often he finds himself shrouded in discomfort as he tells the story. What's the story, you may ask? Well, Bruce tells the story of when he would visit Ghana many, many, many years after Ghana's independence. There he would meet a farmer, a cocoa farmer. It was a good season, he had good harvest. But the cocoa farmer, he didn't want to sell his beans. So Bruce asked why, and then he said, well, I do not want to sell my beans because the asking price in the market is just too low. I want to keep it for a better season. So Bruce said, quite simply, why don't you just eat your beans? To which the farmer will respond, I cannot eat my beans because I grow them for the white man. I cannot eat my beans because I grow them for the white man. Now listen, listen to your thoughts, your feelings and your bodily responses. So the past year, I've been on an immersive journey trying to answer the question, why, to what the farmer said. And I found it at a very, very unusual place. Next, please. I found the answer to the farmer's question at this place, First Baptist Church School, Tema. This was my primary school. This is where I accessed the formative years of my life's education at this school. And I remember quite vividly in class five, year five, my agriculture teacher, Mr. Raymond Midley, was standing in front of the class and for the first time introduced a group of crop to the children, us. These group of crops, they were so special, they even had a name. They will be known and be called as the cash crop. And this is the story of the cash crop. Next slide, please. He defines the cash crop as a group of crops that are grown by the farmer. So the farmer can grow and nurture and nurse the cash crop. He can rub them back and forth and develop a high sense of attunement. But however the story goes with the cash crop, the fruits therein of the cash crop, the farmer will never eat. The cash crop was grown for another. It was a crop that was grown to be sold to another. The interesting thing about the cash crop was the farmer would not determine the price of the cash crop. The buyer or a separate entity determines the price of the cash crop. In Ghana, cocoa is a cash crop. Now listen, listen to your thoughts, your feelings and your bodily responses. Next slide, Tuana. Believe me, the indigents in the country where they grow the cash crop. They know the value of the cash crop. The government knows the value of the cash crop so much so they even put images on their legal tender, 20 peso a coin and some of their banknotes. You may show the banknotes. And so every day, next one. And so every day when the indigents will buy and sell and exchange goods and services, next one, please. They will see the image of the cash crop before they will see the image of the cash crop. They will exchange goods and services with the cash crop. The slide before, please. They will touch the cash crop. They will see images of it, like this one. They will see farmers farming the cash crop. 
But remember, it's a cash crop. So however the story goes, the fruit therein of the cash crop, they will not eat. They will love the cash crop so much. Next slide. They will name their highways and their byways after the cash crop. They will name their clinics and their hospitals after their cash crop. Their sons and daughters will be named after the cash crop. They know the value of the cash crop. But remember, it's a cash crop. So however the story goes, the fruit therein of the cash crop, they will not eat. Do not be surprised. They will even name other food substances after the cash crop. This next one you will see is a root tuber that grows typically, you know this one. Yeah, sometimes they will even make wax prints like this one, Joanna, thank you. They will print images of the, of, of the cash crop on their wax prints. Year after year, they will adorn their bodies with beautiful images of wax prints of this, of this cash crop. Different patterns, different colors. They may wear them to work every Sunday. They may make matching jewelry and wear the fabric. But however the story goes, the fruit therein of the cash crop they will never eat the story of the cash crop. Last image. Sometimes they would even name other food substances after the cash crop. This is a root tuber that grows typically on cocoa farms. This root tuber is named after the cash crop. But remember the fruit, the rain of the cash crop, they will never eat. This is the story of the cash crop. Cocoa is a cash crop. So in Ghana, they may wear wax prints with it. Their legal tender is on there. Their hospitals and clinics are named after it. Their root tubers are named after it. But the fruit therein of the cash crop, they will not eat. But who told the story of the cash crop and how did they tell it? Who defined the cash crop and to whose, at, at whose expense was that definition? Perhaps this is not even a story about Ghana's cocoa. Perhaps this is a story about Africa and its interaction with the rest of the world. A very complex interaction. Some have called it the unequal exchange. Others have called it the unfair trade. Now, listen. Listen to your thoughts, your feelings, and your bodily responses. So today we tell a new story, a story we like to call chocolate has a name because it does. And in this story, we tell the story to incorporate cocoa processing into the everyday learning of children growing up in cocoa communities. Communities like Seshi Bekwai, Seshi Hyosu, Anwemu, and starting with Takwa Brimayo. We tell the story in hopes that policies might change. We tell the story in hopes that eating cultures and language might change. We tell the story and we call it chocolate as a name in hopes that the children might also tell their own story, who knows? They might tell a story they might call the day our being stayed home. We tell the story in hopes that the children's children might also tell their own story, who knows? They might tell a story they might call Coco Beyond the Cash Crop. And we tell this story because the children's children's children might also tell their own story. However they decide to name their story, me, I would always remember that chocolate has a name. So listen, listen to your thoughts, your feelings, and your bodily responses, because chocolate has a name. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks, Adele. That's absolutely extraordinary. Um, do we have uh, Mama Bodwa with us? I want to find out if Mami Bodwa or Mr. Saki has joined us from Amiem. We invited Mami Bodwa to join us on the call. It's going to be a bit tricky with technical difficulties, but they are sure to do their very best to be here. Maybe they are unable to join us at this point, Joanna. Um, so in that case, shall we move on to um, 
Nana um, S.E. Caisley Hayford, who's going to um, explain what the project is, how we're going to tackle this enormous issue of cash crop that people don't feel connected to. Um, Nana, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Nana Essie Casley Hayford. I'm a tribeswoman with Afrikaniwa. Most importantly, I'm also a person with lived experience of the cocoa story. My maternal grandmother was a cocoa farmer and I still have fond memories of the times I would visit my grandmother's village during the school long vac is what we called it, the six week school holidays. My grandmother had similar dreams um, as Mami Bedua to follow her cocoa beans to find out what happened after they left her farm. Grandmother's farm was an arboretum of magical wonder, especially to a child whose formative years had been in the UK. The fruity pulp around each cocoa bean had such a del delectably delicate burst of flavor when it hit my taste buds. I know I wasn't supposed to eat them, but I did. I can only describe it as a nectar of the flora goddesses, which were my grandmother's, my grandmother and my, you know, other matriarchs in the family who worked on the farm. I'd sit beneath the shades of various trees and observe the grown-ups harvesting their pods. There was such community. People would come from surrounding areas to help with the harvesting. Sometimes my cousins and I would help, but often we found other things to occupy us such as climbing yoyi and mango trees and stuffing ourselves. We'd also play pranks on each other as well as the adults. But I digress. I'd like to ask Joanna to show a video if she has it ready. The video is one of many workshops that the fig tree has been organizing with schools around the UK. Thank you, Joanna. Technology always fails us when we least expect it. <laughs> Joanna, your microphone is off. Sorry, it was showing for me. It obviously wasn't showing Philip for you. Let me, let me get it started. Never mind. Still not showing here. Okay, the video um, was um, for a you know a, a group of uh, school children with their teachers, and they had cocoa beans, and the cocoa beans were ground and. Um, sugar as well as um, milk powder added and they they made their own chocolates so um but let me go ahead and share why i feel this project is going to work um the projects will work because these are children in the uk who are so familiar with chocolates <laughs> 
And every so often when they realize that chocolate comes from the cocoa pods that grow on trees, it's hard for them to comprehend. Some of them become distressed, shocked, and then they go through what we refer to in Africanua as cognitive dissonance. Um, it, it just does not make sense to them. Some of the children end up asking whether chocolate is a salad because it grows on trees. Overall, it's an education of wonder and an eye opener for them. We know that the project will work because school children who walk by around and in between cocoa farms are children who spend their weekends on these farms observing their parents work. These are children whose families have, have grown and have been farming cocoa for many years. What we wish to do is add value to something that they already know. The project will work because at the core of this pilot is the community of Cocoa 360, founded by Shadrach Frimpon. The children, the staff, the head teacher, the pupils of Tarqua Brimang Girls School are all, you know, at the core of this project. Going into this space, the values we're sending is community and collaboration with a wider community, both home and abroad. In looking at identity and representation, we want children to see people who look like them and sound like them, everyday people they see in their communities, being at the forefront of this project. We're working with local chocolate makers in Ghana who will organize workshops to teach their teachers, who will in turn pass the knowledge gained onto their pupils. This is only possible because we're talking about collaboration with the wider community. We've also put in place a lot of strategies for careful monitoring and evaluation with the teams at home and abroad, so we can be certain it will work. Much more importantly, Nearly everyone involved in this project is someone with lived, ex with lived experience in cocoa. People have their own personal experiences with cocoa or have come from a lineage of people who have been farming cocoa for so many years. They know the cocoa story. We're working with persons from different fields of expertise, such as local climatologists, local chocolate makers, children's creative writers, persons who have done and continue to conduct extensive research in COCO to put together a syllabus that has local content, content that makes sense so that teachers will be able to contribute to this and deliver in a way that the children will appreciate and understand. What gives us the most hope about this project working is because of all of you on, on this platform today. You believe in it, you've supported it, and you've spent a bit of time with us on here this evening. And with your continued support, we have no doubt that this project will work. Thank you very much. Thanks. Fabulous, Nana. Um, I found the video on a different platform. I'm going to try it just one more time. Thank you. Chocolate and all Ghanaian foods are grown by African dudes, and yet the farmers still don't get to choose. Do you really think it's fair, all this poverty in the air? The farmers should get a fair price for all their goods and things like rice.
Thank you very much, Joanna. Wonderful. I think we we, we have um I think we have Mama Boadwa. Uh, Richard, is that right? Have we got Mami Boadwa on the call? Ah, Richard. Ah, yes, we do. Yes, marvellous. All right, so um, Joanna, you can go ahead and I'll just come in with translation. Okay, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, could you introduce yourself and say what you do, please? Yo, mami bordua yama o akwa babe fidi so eme se yeno kasa be a fin termuni ene di eni yebusi ya fu wa fair trade nishia inti samri yebesi la sa wosu bechle udin. Any be a year out, what be kind of who will feed you so? Mammy would dress a walk as our Cassani and Tinny Papa. Richard, I want to be sure you've you've connected your microphone because we cannot hear you. Is it connected now, Richard? Try again. Okay. Joanna, maybe we could move on. And Richard, you can just put in the chat when you think it's it's working. Thank you. So are we are we moving on to um is it Deco Craft next? Yeah, hello. Hello. Um, I'm Yaira from DecoCats, the chocolate manufacturing company, um, partnering with African Noah. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my CEO, Ms. Ikea Obinoa Donko. Um, she would have loved to be in our midst this evening, but then she's unavailable. So we are DecoCats, we make chocolates, and then our brand name is Kibi, which means take a bite in Ghanaian language tree. And um, this, this basically depicts how um, Ghanaians love to share chocolate among themselves. When one person takes a bar of chocolate, he takes it, takes a bite and passes it on to another person to also take a bite. So we are glad to be on board as the chocolate manufacturing company for this project. Um, as part of our um, corporate social responsibilities, we normally visit um, a few cocoa growing areas, but because we don't have enough capacity. We are not able to reach out to most of the cocoa growing areas. So this um, opportunity will give us the chance to be able to reach out to other cocoa growing areas. And when we went to uh, one of the villages we visited, that's um, Obodan Setafo, the, ch the children over there, the, the, the children, they don't even know chocolate. They've not seen chocolate before. And then they were surprised to see chocolate. So we having to train their teachers to be able to get the skills passed on to the kids will be a great opportunity for us to at the podcast. Thank you. Thanks. I've got some uh, images to show of the, um, the workshops that, uh, that NecoCraft do with the, with the children in, um, in Ghana, let me see if I can share those with you.
So that was uh, just some images uh, of the, the workshops that Deco Crafts doing. And um, so you've seen um, the workshops that, uh, that, that Bruce Crowther does in the UK and the workshops that, that uh, Deco Craft do. And that's what we're looking at doing um, in the um, top of Bremen uh, Girls School and then hopefully beyond that to uh, um, schools in all of the other um, cocoa growing areas of uh, West Africa. So that would be uh, really exciting. Um, shall we try again with uh, Richard? Richard, yeah. Richard, if you can hear us, we want to see the microphone is working now, Richard. Yes, it is. Great. And tomorrow we'll do a ten and yeah, we won't come on. Or Sam Ray, with me your body, you know what the baby are. Also, what the clients are with the baby. I've been able to do a. Yo, and Chepi, you know what you think of more African? You are now what that say? Say, say that to be and car chocolate. Yeah, you go cool. You are the the people who cross the wire. Am I a mofran or mucos one? We must to Miss Yanko and Nibaji P. Sa and Amon in a nea shall see you to know. And see, I send men also walk a margin to our person, yet in it extra a mouthful. Near me, what can I say? Montua soon, yea, dear Mekka, no, I am mammy. Namen so may yea be so at all, dear near Asher, my man. Mami Boydua is really elated to join us on the call today. And Mami Pacha to us. Madam, Madam, I say, Mama, I assume so. My idea, I come here, but I say, I'm young. Well, she finds it quite unbelievable that she should live to see this day where we could even have conversations about bringing. Um, cocoa processing to her community. She feels incredibly elated and she feels oh, so very yeah, mama. she feels privileged to be part of today's meeting for us to have even conversations considering her very, very remote village somewhere in Anrim. Um, she couldn't be happier for herself, her family, her children and her children's children. She is incredibly honored to share in this space and she looks forward to the program a successful pilot that will take on to many steps for her to realize it in her community as well. That's wonderful to hear. And uh, I think it's it's so important that, that we understand that this project is, is coming from the people who are actually um, doing the work in the cocoa fields in, in Ghana um, and, and how important it would have been I mean, I'm sure it would have been a fantastic for, for her to have had this opportunity at school um, and, and to, to for, for Coco not just to be about putting things down from the trees and drying the beans, but actually working tree to bar, basically. I know Bruce does bean to bar. Tree to bar is the way that we're looking at, at growing chocolate, uh, uh, at making chocolate um, in, uh, in Ghana. So that, that's it's a wonderful um, opportunity. Fantastic. Um, so uh, I think we're going to move on. Um, Judith, uh, Miss Crab, um, I think uh, you were uh, involved in, in a fantastic um, project um, uh, on the 14th of February, which in Ghana is National Chocolate Day, right? Yes, yes, yes. I was, hi everybody, good night. Oh, sorry, good evening. Oh my God. Good evening, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so very much for being here today. Um, for holding hands with us and for taking this journey um, with us. Um, like Nanesi said, we do believe it will be a, a success um, and we will make a change in the lives of our people. Um, yeah, so on the 14th of January, a few years ago, um, the president at the time, um, President Mahama, declared it a world, um, a chocolate day for Ghana. So instead of saying Valentine's Day, we went with um, chocolate day. So what we did this time was we got um, the kids of um, Takwa Brennan School, the girls, to um, sample chocolates. And before they did that, though, we gave them a questionnaire. And it was basically, I think it was four questions in the questionnaire. And we just wanted to find out um, what they knew about what we were going to eat. Um, all the kids knew that it was some sort of confectionery. 
Some thought it was candy, some thought it was toffee, but the majority knew that it was chocolate. Um, we also asked them um, if they knew what was gonna, what was um, the ingredients that it was made up of. Some got it right, some did not. Um, I think that um, there are some pictures I think I sent to Joanna. If you could put that up for everyone to see um, how they even went. Yeah, so these are the kids holding the, the bars of chocolate um, with their smiles. Hopefully we'll get more of them smiling as the project goes on. And that's Coco360, our partner. And I think we have a couple more. Yeah, so obviously chocolate makes everybody happy, even the kids. Yes. So more pictures of the kids with their chocolate bars. And obviously this bunch are very, very happy. So um, chocolate does bring happiness and we intend to keep, um, keep the research up with um, as the project goes on and um, just to obviously have a, a way of identifying the progress we are making and um, the direct impact we are having in the lives of these girls. Um, so we'll keep you up to date. Please follow us. Um, we also have a local uh, mobile money um, platform. We would also give that to you at a later date where you could um, send in your donations. So thank you so much for your time, everybody. Thanks, oh, Judith. That's, a, that's amazing. Um, right, those those kids looked really happy to get that the chocolate on on National Chocolate Day. I've just popped in the chat uh, the link for the crowdfunder. Uh, so what we're doing is we're we're asking um, for donations towards the pilot project, and the pilot will be done with the the young ladies that you've just seen at the Tarpa Bremen Girls School. Um, we're Initially, we're fundraising in three chunks. So the first chunk is £4,000 and that covers the equipment. So that's things like the grinders and the fridge and all of the measuring equipment and the things that the, the, we're going to need to set up the workshop. And then over the summer, we're going to be doing a second round of, of fundraising, and that will be to raise money to train the teachers. So how it's going to work is Yaira uh, and her team are going to train up the teachers at the school and they will learn how to make chocolate and they will then be able to share that knowledge. So what we'll have by the end of the summer, we will have a workshop fully functioning at the school and we will have six teachers who know how to do how to run the chocolate workshops. Um, and once uh, once we've got that, the final chunk of fundraising will be um, around trying to, to find the ingredients. Obviously, uh, they'll be able to chop the, the, the um, cocoa pods off the trees, and that's a really important part of chocolate. But we also need milk powder and we need sugar and we need all of the things that uh, that the children are going to need to be able to make the, um, the chocolate themselves and obviously once we've set up the workshop and we've got the training that belongs to the school that will not go away the really really important thing with this project is that it isn't a case of somebody coming in from outside and setting something up that's not sustainable for the school it's so important that this is something that every single girl that goes to that school forever will always have access to that workshop and they will always have access to teachers who know how to train them how to make chocolate so every single child that goes through that school will have this opportunity something very exciting happened the other day i was approached by a uh, foundation of one of the large fair trade co chocolate companies and they really like the idea of this project and what they want to do is to help roll it out with some to some of the schools in West Africa they obviously they already work with, which would be wonderful. But we, that means we need to make this pilot work because they will only invest if they can see evidence that it works. So basically, if we can make this pilot work, the next place we will do it will be New Koferidua, which is the first fair trade town in Africa. And then beyond that, there will be other, other organizations that will be able to invest in this for other cocoa growing communities. Um, and, and as Muin Tombo says in the chat, chocolate must stay home. There's a part of the project is called the day the beans came home. And that's so important is that Ghana 
as Adele's explained, is so tied up with chocolate. It's so important to the people of Ghana and, and Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon and, and Nigeria and, and you know, South Timor and Prince, all of those places. This is where cocoa is grown and this is where the beans must stay home. And the value that comes with processing those beans, that must stay home as well. So if you're a work town, there are 2,000 fair trade towns around the, the world. There are over 400 in the UK. If each one of those fair trade groups donated just £25, we would be able to, to finance this project. Obviously, if you can, if you can afford more, that's absolutely fantastic. What I would love us to do as a community of fair trade campaigners and supporters is for us to finance this project collectively so that we as fair trade campaigners made this happen for the children of cocoa farmers that we rely upon, the people that we campaign for, the people whose lives are so inextricably linked with ours. How wonderful would that be if we collectively as grassroots campaigners got this campaign off the ground. So the link, I'll, I'll put it in the chat again, the link to the crowdfunder. Um, please go away and think about it with your fair trade groups as individuals. What can you do to help get this, put this get the party started, help us get this off the ground? Um, I'm going to move now on to uh, Chief Moomin, who is a poet from Ghana, and he's going to uh, um, share some, some thoughts with us. How heavy is a bar of chocolate? When you break that piece and melt its essence in your mouth, how much does it weigh on your tongue? As the sweetness fills your orifice and feels its way down your being, how heavy is a bar of chocolate? 64 kilograms. That is what chocolate weighs for the young men who summon Herculean strength at back-breaking wrecks to carry bags of cocoa from large trucks to warehouses and from warehouses into large trucks as these coveted beans are transported from farms to industry and then transformed into those sweet weightless bars that adorn our shelves. 64 kilograms they carry over and over again throughout the day for months, for years, for the best of their youth. A bag of cement is 50 kilograms, and they carry 64, sometimes two bags at a time, 128 kilograms. So here's to them who carry the weights on their backs that we may feel the sweetness on our tongues. Here's to them who carry the weights on their backs that we may feel the sweetness on our tongues. Here's to the farmers who break their backs day in and day out, back to back, that we may never lack our delicious melting moments. Here's to the women and children who join in communion to crack the pots, to dry the beans, to fill the sacks, to go the trucks. Here is the communities all around cocoa growing areas who form the foundation of the cocoa value chain, but who often benefit the least in the value they produce. Today, they stand in the spotlight. Today, we hear their hopes and their dreams and we gather today to build greater value for them. That together we can taste the sweetness. So that together they can taste the sweetness that they give to the world. Today, we strive to make trade fairer for these unsung heroes and heroines. Today, we strive to make trade fairer for these unsung heroes and heroines. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so we have Bruce with us. Uh, we've already seen um, Bruce, well, we've seen an image of Bruce, but we've also seen um, the video. Um, so Bruce, do you, uh, how, how, did, how did Man United get on? I don't know. <laughs> oh, not good, I'm afraid, but oh, no. it's only football. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, not a, not a good day football-wise, but it's wonderful to be here at this meeting. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. It's so exciting and it takes away the pain of the football, I'm glad to say. So, um, yeah, so do you want me to... Um, yeah, was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I was a bit late joining you um, and I'm not sure what has already been said, whether Adele has told you the story, but I'd like to share with you my story, which um, how I got involved with the project, um, which is included in my book. Um, uh, not in my lifetime, which I wrote last year. Um, and it was when I first went to Ghana in 2001, and um, previously to going to Ghana, um, I'd seen a documentary about a cocoa farmer, and the price of cocoa was so low that he was forced to keep his four sacks for cocoa until the price got higher. And during that time, his family went hungry. At that time, I knew very little about chocolate, but I did know that it was a highly nutritious food and it kept haunting me. Why did he never use and eat the chocolate for himself and his family? So when I went to Ghana, we visited New Kofodia, which is now the first factory town in Africa. And I asked the cocoa farmer there, why do you never eat your own chocolate? And his answer he gave me sent a shiver down my spine. And every time I repeat the story, it still sends a shudder down my spine. He said, and this is 50 years after Ghanaian independence from British rule. And he said, the cocoa does not belong to us, it belongs to the British. I was absolutely stunned. As I said, it still, it still hits me today. And that there and then I had this vision that we should do chocolate workshops in schools, both in the UK and in Ghana. So the children in the UK can learn about where cocoa is coming from, learn about the farmers who work so hard to produce it and how they deserve a fair price. And probably more importantly, the children in Ghana would learn where the cocoa goes to, how to make chocolate, and most importantly, it belongs to them. It is their cocoa for them to do with what they wish. After that, we came home and we started to do the UK workshops, which as you've seen, um, in the early days, that video that you just saw was in the very beginning. And I have to be honest, we didn't really know what we were doing at that stage. Um, people told me you can't possibly make chocolate in the classroom, which made me even more determined to make sure that we could. Um, and we learned, we learned the process. Those days we used um, small coffee grinders and we went through those like nothing on earth. We, we burnt out so many of them. As time went on, we started to adapt more and we learned to use better equipment. We have this, which is the coffee grinder that we use today, which is a much heavier, better piece of equipment. Um, it's important because grinding cocoa into a liquid is not an easy task um, uh, and you need a good grinder and therefore it's very important. And if you're not gonna use the grinder that we use, then I would certainly look, make sure that you test the one that you're gonna be looking at doing because it took us a long time to get to a grinder that we could really rely on. We've had those now for many years and they've been very reliable. We also learned to make chocolate ourselves and, um, it, and the fig tree now makes its own chocolate, which we sell commercially. Um, but I have to emphasize the process we do in this classroom is not the same totally as the process we do to make chocolate that we sell commercially. Um, when we make the chocolate commercially, we use that grinder to get it into liquid. And then we use this melanger here to actually uh, what we call conch the chocolate and mix the chocolate for about three days. So um, obviously that's not something we can do in the classroom. Um, the other thing is once the chocolate is made, it's then tempered and molded, which again, we can't do the tempering in the classroom. Um, uh, maybe you guys, when you do this in, in Ghana, you might find ways of doing this, but we couldn't. So the chocolate they produced in the classroom was not quite the same as the stuff that they're used to buying. It was a lot more gritty and it wasn't tempered. Uh, the tempering didn't matter too much because the chocolate was never gonna be kept. It was gonna be eaten straight away. So it didn't matter too much. Um, Anyway, we were successful with those workshops. We've done now about 66 of those workshops, putting about around 2,000 children through those workshops over the, over the period of the time we've been running them. And we're very pleased with them. Um, when I wrote the book, I ended with the line, um, when I told that story, I ended with the line, we still have to hold the workshops in Ghana. 
And I must admit, I didn't think I was so positive when I actually wrote it. We still have to. I actually thought at this point they were never going to take place in Ghana. I had the great privilege last fair trade fortnight of last year. Uh, Adele invited me to their um, video link, um, uh, which I was part of. And I shared that story with them. And the people there said, well, we were going to be, do these workshops in Ghana, which is fantastic. Because as everybody's saying, we don't want people like me going to Ghana to do those workshops. We want them done by local people who understand how the system works in Ghana. And this idea of getting it onto the curriculum so that all the schools in Ghana, so all the children of cocoa farmers can learn how to make chocolate is beyond my greatest dream. And believe me, I've had some big dreams in my time, but this really is, is, is the best. It's fantastic. Um, so that's where we are. I'm just so excited to be with you. Um, I will do all I can to help you um, uh, with what we've learned from running our workshops. Um, having said that, I'm quite sure that the chocolate makers in Ghana will know how to do this and do it for, um, for the children there. Um, but I'm so excited. And the idea that one day the children in New Kofi idea will be making chocolate grown by their parents, um, with cocoa grown by their parents, just completely thrills me and makes up for the awful defeat that we had today in the football match. But um, wonderful to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, that sounds amazing. One of the things that I, if we're doing blue sky thinking, one of the things that I would really love is if we could introduce ecotourism, fair trade tourism, so that you had the opportunity or we as the people that started this project and financed it at the beginning, have the opportunity to go to Ghana and do a workshop um, uh, and we could learn to make chocolate, tree to bar chocolate in Ghana, in New Kofari Dua, um, and to, to actually get a sense of what the place is like, what it's like to grow cocoa, what it's like to make chocolate, how, those things are so ingrained and entrenched in, in, in Ghanaian society. And I think that's a really good opportunity. So um, there's lots and lots of, of ways that we can make this work, I think. Um, and there's, there's lots of really, really exciting partnerships around it. Um, I'm going to call now on uh, Moro Seidu um, from Coco 360, because I know you're really, really um, an important part of the um, whole process um, and so I wonder if you could share with us the um, the idea um, your ideas for the project and, and how it's going to work are you there Maura, your microphone is off, please. Good. At Coco uh, 360, I would say that we work as a team. And as a team, we have an uh, efficient uh, administrators and teachers that will ensure that whatever we are discussing here today would be very fruitful. But the headmistress will ensure that this project will be well executed to the point where every student at the end of the project will know how to make a chocolate or let's say a bar of chocolate with the support of the PTA and other teaching staff. I know that uh, it's going to be a successful project. But doing that requires a lot of effort from Africaniwa as well, because we work as a, as a team. With their monitoring and evaluation, we will be able to ensure that uh, they are always on our campus. And also, we will, will also open our lab for any innovational expansion to ensure that our children, our kids get the best of education and also the best of children in making cocoa. Yes, we are embracing Africaniwa. Yes, we are embracing Petri because we want to actually create a path 
that will ensure that not only in Taka Bremen Girls School, but in other schools in the communities, they will know how to make chocolates because their parents are producing the beans, because their efforts count, because the future is for them. It can't always be we buying chocolates for them, but let's say during Valentine, during chocolate day, they can also make their own chocolate. And they will believe that the cocoa tree in their backyard is what is giving them what they have right now. Yes, they called me, but I'm. Here with the headmistress, and they was. I think the girls were so excited to even have a bar of chocolate. So all what I would say is thank you so much to um, Kabi Kabi Company. Yes. Um, the girl even wait to see the um. The items that uh, thank you so much for for the chocolates for the girls of Takwa Brahman girls too. They were so excited, and that day we couldn't even help asking more questions about these chocolates. And the teachers were trying to explain to them that the chocolate is coming from um, the cocoa. We have to explain it, explain it, explain it again and again before they understand that, oh yes. So how can we make a chocolate? They were questioning me. And I told them they should have patience. Um, it is on the pipeline. So um I think for now we are ready, Tapa Remind Girls to we are ready waiting to see how best um, this project. It is, uh, this project will go on. Um, secondly, is, um, I think they also promised us for um, a curriculum or a guideline or a stream of work that will guide the teachers to start explaining um, how um, they make chocolate before they arrive. So we are ready and then we can't wait to see them coming to um, run a workshop or teach these teachers or teach our girls how to make a chocolate. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, the girls will be really excited to uh, to learn how to make chocolate. And and um, one of the things that we need to stress is that this is this is a lesson that's really important for them because it's it's a history lesson it's a geography lesson it's a domestic science lesson it's it's about teaching them about nutrition but it's also giving them a sense that they can be entrepreneurs that they can they can get a better job in in coco so that coco can be a really good future for these girls um, and that feels really important it's aspiration for them Will you also want to hear from the parent from Tapa Berman Girls School, who is also a farmer? Yes, that would be lovely. Mamma, uh, my father, you did say, Sir, you may be a thing for a king, same as a boy. That I am a legit Mr. Jerry, 
how do you see the project you coming from especially the country to say and also an enabling partner in that good evening everyone thank you so much for having us well um having the girls to learn how uh, cocoa is being used to um, produce chocolate will go a very long way to also help them and their parents in the production level uh, first of all some of the girls see the cocoa as being just um, a job or part of family inheritance for their parents so if you don't go to school it's either you become a, a farmer a cocoa farmer uh, some of the families are having these huge farms um, cultivated by their great great grandparents so they just come inherit the farms they don't go to school they just become a, a cocoa farmer but then if they also get to know the importance of cocoa and the uses of cocoa and how the delicious chocolate they always eat on uh, every Valentine's Day or the chocolate day, they will get to know the essence of helping their parents, both technically and then producing or giving them any other um, support on the farm. Aside trying to be the doctors, the nurses, the accountants, they will also have the passion of helping their parents on the farm to produce more and also uh, the knowledge of also using cocoa for, for other things apart from um, you know, apart from the beverages, apart from the chocolate and other things. So we are very excited to, I mean, have you in advance on campus for the girls and uh, you know it will go a very long way to help the communities, even um, the other communities in, in our district and the nation as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I think Adele, you, you wanted to come, come in now? Yes, yes, I wanted to say thank you to the Cocoa 360 family. We've, we've heard from the head teacher and the farmers, and it's interesting how these conversation unfold. When the farmer, who is also a parent and a member of the PTA, says, Inimunimuya, it means Joanna, they haven't got time. They are waiting and they are waiting with giddy joy. And for me, that's important because this will not be the first time people in rural Ghana have been promised heaven and be delivered nothing. And so it puts a lot of pressure on us to make sure we deliver and we deliver well. Um, I see a lot of conversations going on in the chat. Um, we've got a few of our tribesmen and women there who are trying really hard to answer. Kwame Kwatin has done extensive research in Coco and I see that he's been able to answer a lot of the questions and so has Miss Crab. The incredible thing is, Tom Griffith shares his, his experience with cocoa about three hours before joining the call. And he says he has a lived experience of eating chocolates. That's the amazing thing. The cocoa story is always a shared story. Even when your team loses, the winners and the losers, we can sit over a drink of chocolate and just smile it away. And so I just want to say that hearing all these stories, Mami Buedua, the PTA, Coco 360, all the many questions coming, is for us to pilot this project, a project that is really putting the community at the forefront and making it very, very sustainable so we can replicate to the many, many, many other cocoa growing communities in Ghana. Um, it's incredible, Joanna and I'm honored to be part of this. Thank you. It's so exciting. Uh, so now we, we've got um, a few minutes for a question and answer. So if anybody's got any any questions, I know as, as Adele said, that lots of your questions are being answered in the chat, but if you do have any more, you can either put your hand up. Uh, there's a lot of us on the call. So if you can use the, uh, the reactions button to put your hand up and I'll see you straight away. Um, and then we can we can answer any questions that you've got. Um, so I think uh, yeah, one of the things that that I wanted to stress um, is that this isn't about getting the children to make things so that we can sell them straight away because that's child labour and that's something we want to, to shy away from. <laughs> what it's about giving them something that's for them so that they go to the workshop and they make the, 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 their bar of chocolate. And you saw how excited they were to get the bar of chocolate on Valentine's Day, on, on Ghana's um, National Chocolate Day. Imagine how, how excited they would be if they, following the children in the UK, would be able to, um, to make their own chocolate um, and take that home with them. 
or one of the one of the interesting things that we want to do with the project once we've got a sense of this is what this amazing bean does try and incorporate it into some of the traditional Ghanaian recipes that they're learning at home so actually the, the, the wonderful nutrition that you can get make it into a drink that they can have at the beginning of the school day so that they're not going to school hungry so that, that everybody can share in the wealth it's all about us sharing in the wealth it's all about allowing children in these areas to um, to understand why cocoa is on the banknotes why it's such an important crop uh, so Marianne is asking when the project's expected to start um, so essentially it depends how quickly we get hold of the all the funding that we need um, I think Mariana was a little bit later I, I, I outlined it earlier so we're going to be fundraising in three chunks the, what we're doing at the moment is, is raising money to buy the equipment once we've bought that we can set up the workshop at the school over the summer, we'll be raising money to train the teachers. Um, and that uh, one of the things that I'm going to be doing, and I would like to inv invite people to join me, um, I'm going to be doing the, the Fair Trade Way, which is a walk between the first fair trade town in the world, Garstang, which is about 15 miles up the road from me. I'll be walking from there to Keswick uh, from the 27th of May till the 1st of June. So if anybody's around and wants to join me, um, that will be a sponsored work. So I'll be I'll be doing that to raise money and awareness for this project. Um, and, and then later on in the summer, I'll be doing a very similar thing around Bradford. So there's a fair trade walk that takes you all around Bradford. That still needs to be 100% mapped. So we're going to be mapping that out. And that, again, will be to, to raise money and awareness for this project. Anybody who's a fair trade campaigner and supporter um, is very welcome to join me on, the, on those journeys. Um, and I think it's really important that, that we, we keep it in, in mind and, and we, we don't try and do this. Um, we, we need to do it mindfully. We need to, to um, understand all the different ways that we need to make this work. So at every stage, we'll be thinking, what is the best way to do this? So the equipment will be bought, the teachers will be trained. And then the third part will be buying the ingredients so that we can start the workshops. Hopefully, this time next year, we will have already had some workshops um, up and running and the girls with it will have learnt, um, learnt some, some chocolate making. I will be going to Ghana in October. Uh, I will be taking films and videos and, and, um, and photos and I will be able to share them with you as to how far we've got with the project. Hopefully at that stage, we'll have a workshop set up and we will have some teachers who are trained. And maybe even while I'm there, we'll be able to, um, to have the, the children work making chocolates. But if not, I will certainly um, speak to them and, and help you um, understand how, where, we, where we are with the project. And I'm, I'm funding that myself, by the way, that's not, that's not coming out of the money that you, you will be donating. That's just me doing something um, exciting. Um, and also Bruce has asked me to bring him back a bag of cocoa beans from New Copper Igua. So I need to go for that, if nothing else. So we've shared uh, the crowdfunding link. We've shared the campaign video. Um, and so, um, yeah, do we, do we have any more questions, any more uh, concerns or ideas? Um, I, can't see I wanted anything. to add. I wanted to add that you know we're it's a whole year of fundraise, and there are so many creative, innovative ways to go about this. Invite us to your small group. Invite us to your big group. We have actually curated a whole exhibition of photos, and that was what we put together on Africaniwa as the chocolate has a name exhibition. So this Easter, when you're doing the body hunt, invite us to come and tell the story. Chocolate has a name. Um, invite us into your geography class to add more nuance to what your children are being taught at school. Um, we are borderless people. We can come through Zoom. We can come face to face and host these exhibition proceeds of which will go to support um, the fundraise. And we are hoping that everything works well, we'll be able to raise all the amount we need and possibly more to make this project actually a reality for the children, and all of the community at Takwa Brimman. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of football talk in the chat um, <laughs> about the idea that, that we need to find a, um, a, a, a 
footballer or somebody of, of, of a similar sort of standing to be able to um, really push the, the campaign out to, uh, to support us. And I, that's not something that I'm an expert in, but if anybody knows, if anybody knows any celebrities, if anybody knows any, any sports people, if anybody has somebody who they think would be really passionate about this, and has a connection to Ghana. I think that's the important thing is that it's it's about keeping um, keeping it local in terms of everything that has to be done has to be done by, in this case, Ghanaians. And then when we move beyond, the Ivorians will be doing it in Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroonians will be doing it. If, if we expand it, it will always be done by chocolate makers on the ground. It will always be done by people who are there and understand how to make it work properly. Because it's always been so important that, uh, that, that, we, we, that it comes from the people who are there and the cocoa farmers who are there and, and they understand how important it is for their, um, their families. So what I'm going to say, I'm going to put my direct email in the chat. If anybody does have any questions or concerns about it, you're very welcome to email me um, afterwards and uh, or follow up the Fair Trade NCC and African EWA on social media, find out a little bit more um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to answer any of the questions that you might have. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to pass over to, to Adele um, just for a recap and, and to sort of reflect on, on what we've seen and what we've heard tonight. Thank you so much, Wale. Um I've always said on the cocoa story, but one day all that would change because I saw a woman in a red face mask who didn't look like my grandmother, who didn't look like a cocoa farmer, because I know cocoa farmers. And although she didn't look like my kinfolk, she knew something. She knew that it was unfair for Nestle to say that they were no longer going to make Kit Kat with beans that were not fair trade. That was the day the cocoa story ceased to be my story. It became a shared story, but most importantly, our shared humanity. At African Iwa, we always say, when a people are forgotten, their humanity is lost. So this project, is in a way bringing back humanity to cocoa growing communities, to persons like Mami Boudreau. I would love to see the day Mami Boudreau will walk through the aisles somewhere in Waitrose or Asda or Tesco's or Aldi or Lidl, exploring the chocolate. I would love to see that day. I would love to see the day that children in cocoa growing communities will wake up in the morning and it's just the most natural thing that they drink a cold or warm cup of chocolate before they go to school. I've been at many, many events and they talk about sustainability. They talk about all that is going on with the climate and it's always about the bean to the bar. Whatever happened to the consumer, to the cultivator? I think this is a product that chooses people over their produce. This is a project that chooses the thumbprint over the barcode. And tonight, I'm not sure if Mr. Saki is here. I just want to say thank you. I'm in awe of you and for your support. When we needed a cocoa farmer, it was difficult. Making phone calls to my grandmother's farm was difficult. The lines were not going through. I was not getting through to anybody. And it was Mr. Saki who was able to connect us to Mami Bordua. He works with these farmers in the villages. He's there nearly always every time and is such a person that we want to work with. Follow us on social media. There's a lot we are hoping to do this year to get you to connect more with cocoa farmers, to get you to speak to them and ask them questions in real time for them to answer in real time. Not long ago, I received an email from America's fair, first um, fair trade town. And at the bottom of the email, I saw this, which is the vision of fair trade a world where justice and sustainability are the heart of trade structures and practices, allowing every person to enjoy a secure livelihood. In African Iwa, we say that this is a future where man will live with the other, with a heart 
as light as a feather. Perhaps today we begin one of many steps to see this vision actually materialize. It is a shared story, it is a shared history, but most importantly, our shared humanity. When the people are forgotten, their humanity is lost. Thank you, good night. Thanks Adele, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to um, just share with you the video that we made, um, well, that Adele made and, and African Iwa um, last year. Um, I'm going to share it from the uh, crowdfunding page so you see what that looks like well. Thank you. I love you. Well done. I'm sorry. Have my sympathy. Sometimes words aren't just enough and a bar of chocolate may be the one thing to piece it all together. It's no music but universal language. It cannot speak but speaks volumes. And these, these are the guardian's hands. These are the hands that tails, that toils, the nurses, the nurtures, the harvest, the breaks, the scoops, the ferments, the dries, the bags, the ways, the carries, the leaves and cleaves of her labor to a far, far away land. And these, these are the guardian's hands. These are the hands that are always forgotten and ever remains impoverished. They say bean to bar, we say cultivator to consumer. Chocolate has a name, and oftentimes that name is... Guadua. Zaki. Salam. Welcome. Jemfi. Moro. Natalie. The wine tasted sweeter, covered in glitter, when its guardians tasted bitter. We can do better, so don't be a quitter. Get on Twitter and hashtag chocolate has a name. Choose your world. Choose fair trade. Because chocolate has a name. Thank you, Joanna. I wanted to add that that was actually Mami Buedua in the video. And we call her in the tribe, the woman with the guardian hands. Mami Buedua is the guardian hands. And the names and the voices, they were all from farmers. And the last one, the consumer, was Natalie. And Bruce was in that video. Everybody who loves chocolate, who works, who makes, who enjoys chocolate, was included in that video. A very organic video. Please share, 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 share. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for, for coming along tonight. Uh, we've shared the crowdfunder several times. Um, if you can contribute to that, if you can go and speak to, to your fair, local fair trade group, if you know anybody else who might be interested in supporting this fantastic venture, wonderful. Um, I'm going, we're going to um, play out now with, uh, with another track from um, Richard Weaffe, who um, open for us um, and this is called I Stand With Farmers uh, which I think is exactly what we're trying to do uh, with Chocolate Has A Name. It's our responsibility to support and rally behind fair trade because there is no organization in the world that stands with farmers as fair trade does. Now, let's go! Nobody support producers and farmers like we do. Like we do. Nobody honor producers and farmers like we do. Like we do. Nobody connect producers and farmers to consumers. 
the farmers all around the world, all around the world, struggling for, struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade, terms of trade, new hope for the world, new hope for the world, a fair trade begins, a fair trade begins, new hope for the world, a fair trade begins, a fair trade begins, producers and farmers all around. Struggling for, struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade, terms of trade. products on the market. When you shop, look for the fair trade mark. Buy fair and donate today. Nobody support producers and farmers like we do. Like we do. Nobody honor producers and farmers like we do. Nobody connect producers and farmers to consumers. All oh, producers and farmers all around the world, all around the world, struggling for, struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade, terms of trade. Struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade, terms of trade, new hope for the world. New hope for the world, a fairer trade begins. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'll be sending out the link to the recording if there's anything you missed, anything you wanted to go over. Um, wonderful to um, to hear from everybody. Um, and I really hope that you can get behind this project. It's so exciting to be able to uh, to do something that's um, that, that's going to have, I think, such an incredible effect on them. On, on uh, certainly the, the young ladies at the Tarqua Bremen School and hopefully lots of other schools in the future. Thank you. Oh, Hannah, yes, let's do that. <laughs>